to be alive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of I Focus Online. Uh, today is our third episode in the uh, Lens module, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kiran Kirtani, who is a senior consultant at Center for Sight, New Delhi, and she will be covering the topic of uh, preoperative workup and assessment of a cataract patient. So, Dr. Uh, Pranita, can you just give the introduction for uh, Dr. Kiran? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I'll be introducing our speaker. Dr. Kiran Girtani has done her MBBS from BJ Medical College, Ahmedabad, following which she did her post-graduation in ophthalmology, for which she was a gold medalist as well. And she did this from MJI Institute Civil Hospital, Ahmedabad. Subsequently, she pursued her senior residency from DDU Hospital in New Delhi. And currently, she's working as a senior consultant in Center for Sight Eye Hospital in Delhi itself. She is a trained and certified femtocatrach surgeon as well as LASIK and refractive surgeon. She's been an organizing secretary for the prestigious PG training program that is the Eye Focus and also for IRSI. She's been a faculty for various uh, national conferences and has authored various book chapters and publications in index journal. So we welcome uh, we welcome Dr. Kiran Kirtani for her talk on a preoperative assessment of a patient for cataract surgery. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pranita. Without wasting much time, I would prefer to, uh, you know, share my screen and start with the class that we are supposed to take today. So, is my screen visible? Oh, no, doctor, you need to share again. Is my screen visible? No, not now. Not now. Just share again and select the screen. Yeah. Is it visible now? Yes, perfect, perfect. Yeah. yeah. So our topic today is that of preoperative assessment of a patient with a cataract surgeon uh, with a cataract uh, complaint. So the preoperative assessment that we are talking here about should be including a thorough ocular and systemic history. I think you're not audible, Dr. Kiran. Yeah, your voice. Yes, we cannot hear you, ma'am. To begin with, we could hear you, but. No, ma'am, no, not audible yet. Mm -hmm. We can't hear you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Can, Dr. can you just check your microphone and the settings for once? Uh, the audio settings, just check the mega microphone. You can stop the share for a minute. Just adjust into the mute button, ma'am. There you can see uh, if you click on that arrow, you can test the speaker and microphone. Yeah, this is on. Yeah, yeah. yes, ma'am. We can hear you we now. Can hear you. Yeah, so uh, is the screen in full screen mode only? I uh, know. Do you need to reshare, doctor? I'll reshare. Yeah, is it visible? And am I audible? G, G, ma'am. Yeah, you're audible. Thank you. Right. So I'm saying preoperative assessment of a patient of cataract surgery has to be in the form of a step by step approach where we first take. Yeah, again, I think. Uh, or ocular and systemic history, followed by the clinical examination of this patient. Is it cracking everywhere? No, no, it's okay, doctor. Please continue. The clinical examination has to be followed up by calculations. The patient needs to be advised certain suitable laboratory investigations. Meanwhile, preoperatively preparing the patient for the day. What is the goal? Why are we needing to do a pre-op assessment of this patient? The goal will lead to a plan and the plan will lead to a thorough action which will give best results for the patient and a deep sigh of relief for the surgeon. So the purpose of the entire assessment is to ensure that the symptoms are consistent with the cataract. Preoperatively itself, the purpose is to identify and avoid any potential source of intraoperative complications. There has to be a match of the goal 
that the surgeon is carrying and the patient is carrying. That is a meeting of the anticipations of the patient vis-a-vis -vis the kind of cataract or the kind of eye potential he or she has. And finally, matching the proper technology to this particular patient. As we all know, that a cataract with visual acuity less than 6 by 9 may be present in only 5% of the people with 50 to 65 age. However, more than 40% of the people above the age of 75, 75 with a vision less than 6 by 9 will definitely have a cataract. And from the anatomy, you have already learned that nuclear cataract, cortical cataract, and posterior subcapsular cataract are the major subtypes where nucleus is the most common type of cataract. What exactly does a cataract do? It impacts the distance vision and also various activities of daily living. However, this distance vision, if it decreases and it's worth than 2025, it increases the chances of a patient going for more falls and fractures. Worse than 2040, decreased overall quality of life. And worse than 2050, there are very high chances of motor vehicle accidents with impaired visual field and contrast sensitivity. Hence, the need to identify the correct patient and treat the patient as per the requirement of this particular patient. So ocular history is the prime most thing with which the patient is coming to you. You need to know and ask what is the history of the present illness? What is the you know, limit of the visual decline? Are the glasses not improving the sight anymore? Where is the decrease in vision, distance, near or both? Has the patient been finding any decrease in the color perception? Or are there glazed starbursts or halos around the light? There can be worsening of vision in a particular period of day and the patient can also present with monoocular, single eye, diplopia or polyopia. There are specific questionnaires also available which is like VFI 14 or the shortened version of visual function 8R which have been designed scientifically and for research purposes as well to assess functional impairment in the cataract patients. So if you see in the right image you see a, cat, a clear lens which is focusing the image well However, on this particular slide, you're able to see that a cataract is causing so much of scattering of light that it can present not only as a hazy vision in all distances, but can give rise to various phenomena such as starburst, halo, or glare, which can be debilitating for the patient while the patient is driving. Even monoocular diplopia can be a possibility. We know that nuclear cataracts will tend to induce more of a myopic shift. So the patient came to you last time, he was having a minus 0.25 number, 60-year-old patient, now 62 years old, two years later, and suddenly the number has become minus 4. The first thing that should come to your mind is that a nuclear cataract could be developing. A nuclear cataract will not only induce a myopic shift, it will reduce the distance vision more than near vision. It will give rise to loss of contrast and contrast sensitivity and difficulty in night vision, especially nighttime glares. Whereas a posterior subcapsular cataract will be more rapid in presentation, affecting the near vision more than distance vision, greater disturbances in brighter illumination, and disabling symptoms, especially in the daytime. So as we see, the different types of cataracts vis-a-vis -vis cortical, nuclear, or posterior subcapsular will have different growth rate, glare possibility, effect of vision on the distance or near, and induction of myopia in the uh, various case scenarios. So in ocular history, you also need to ask the patient about history of any previous glasses or contact lenses, whether there has been any history of trauma, any history of UV. Not only in defining the disability, in, in later on, as we read, it will also help you in identifying which kind of lens that you're choosing for the patient will be right for the kind of, not every lens will match every patient. So you have to match the tech that is uh, available to your patient. Also examine any previous eye records which are available to you. So uh, last but not the least in the ocular history examination, you also need to ask the patient what is the patient's perception about his or her vision? For example, patient is having a nuclear cataract in both the eyes, almost similar grade. One eye has a 6 by 9 vision, the other eye has a 6 by 36 vision. If you dive deep, you may come to know that the patient will report that one eye had a less vision right from the beginning, right from childhood or as long as he or she can remember. So a possibility of amblyopia.
Dr. Kiran, you're not audible. In between, ma'am, your voice is getting uh, missed out, I think. No, not yet, ma'am. Of the ocular history, a glaucoma or a retinal, any previous cataract surgery in the fellation currently, as to what are the patient's expectations? Audible, Pranita? Uh, Ma'am, uh, have you talked? Yes, continue, Doctor. Please continue. There is a uh -huh. audio lag from your side, but please continue. Continue, Ma'am. All right. So, coming to the systemic history, you need to ask the patient about the social history, the occupation that the patient has, as uh, any kind of uh, chemical dependencies can tend to affect the post-operative recovery. What is the family history and ocular and systemic diseases which are there in the family? Assess the patient's medical history. Also ask history of smoking, breathing difficulty, alcoholism, and also drug history, which is important here. Anticoagulants, which need to be stopped five to seven days prior. Any antihypertensive or history of diabetes that the patient is having. Is there any insulin dependency? History of steroids, any hypersensitivity or to medications, and also a history of alpha-1 A antagonist, because these specific drugs are responsible for intraoperative floppy iris syndrome and can cause paralysis of the pupillary dilatory muscles. Now, coming to the patient cooperation, this also has to be examined while you are taking the systemic history of the patient. Any tremors that the patient is having, any nystagmus that the patient is having, are there any difficulties in hearing, in communication, any fear, anxiety? Any difficulty in lying down straight, the patient is having breathlessness or orthopnea, severe kyphosis or scoliosis needs to be ruled out. Coming to the most important part, which is the clinical examination. Visual acuity is the first and foremost thing that you need to ask or need to confirm in this patient. If the patient's cataract is very dense and he's not able to read on any of the charts available or even near face, please confirm the perception of light and most importantly, the projection of rays in all quadrants, because this is one single method which will give you a proxy of the health of retina the patient has. Though it won't be able to tell you very well about the macular health, but an overall assessment of the retinal health will be available by just checking the PR in all quadrants. There are various visual acuity tests available. However, the most commonly, the one that we do are either direction identification in form of, of Snellen's E or Landau C chart or letter identification test in form of Snellen's letter chart or say maybe Logma chart. But as we have known over the years, visual acuity is the most common method, but not the only predictor of post-operative vision and also patient satisfaction. Patient can have poor quality of vision despite being good on standard visual acuity charge. So it's very important to assess a So these are the visual acuity tests and the peliropsin contrast sensitivity test. One you have, once you have done the visual acuity assessment and the contrast sensitivity assessment, we come to the clinical examination first in diffuse torchlight. Do not forget the importance of step-by-step -step approach as you are approaching each and every of your patient. In diffuse torchlight examination, you can rule out dermatoculosis and esenthyl asthma, which is you know causing the lids to not open properly. What is the position of the eyes? If the eyes are very deep set, the socket is very deep, you can do a cover uncover test to find out any paralytic squint or any uh, you know any uh, exotropia or esotropia congruity of movements in all cardinal positions of gaze and facial asymmetry because patient could be having a bad blepharospasm and this will also tend to affect your results well begun is half done half of your battle of cataract is sorted if you have done your slit lamp examination thoroughly so when you start doing your slit lamp examination, start bang from the ocular retinexa. Do not straight away go to the cataract because a lot of information is being obtained the moment you are starting from the lids. So if there is any abnormality in the lid position, if there are misdirected cilia, there is presence of any blepharitis or mebomitis, 
do do definitely do the roplas test that is the regurgitation on pressure over the lacrimal sac area if there is any regurgitation there is uh, rule out any conjunctival congestion or infection and also see the tear film height all of this is being done to find out how is the ocular surface of the patient behaving it is very important to first treat any potential source of ocular infection this is the part which is nearest to your eye once it is opened for cataract surgery and most important reason why an infection or a post operative endophthalmitis occur so rule out any potential source of infection and optimize the ocular surface prior to any further intervention so you see in these images there is a case of squamous blepharitis in the uh, in this image and uh, entropion a punctum eversion which is giving rise to epiphora this frothy lid margin which is occurring because of a meibomian gland dysfunction a pyogenic granuloma you need to cater to all these clinical conditions before you are embarking on the journey of a cataract surgery coming to the status of cornea you have to note what is the status of the arcus how you know how large the arcus is what is the location what is the grade what is are there any corneal opacities or scarring is there any presence of pigments or kps on the uh, on the endothelium any presence of fuchs dystrophy extremely important also notice the depth of anterior chamber what is the way in which the iris and pupil is behaving are there any areas of atrophy is there any alteration in the pattern of iris any neovascularization or tremulousness because all these factors will affect your intraoperative ease and hence your post operative results so if you see here this eye in the left is having punctate epithelial erosions or uh, this kind of an ocular surface if you have straight away done for a cataract surgery patient will be in extreme discomfort and post operative dry eye is anyways a known phenomena so pre operative such a severe dry eye first has to be treated and optimized and then only a cataract surgery should be thought of in the right uh, in the right image you can see these are the corneal gutae which are indicative of fuchs endothelial dystrophy you need to take appropriate steps as we'll discuss later when you are deciding for a case of fuchs endothelial dystrophy and warn the patient accordingly there are uh, this is an image of an epithelial basement membrane dystrophy so here also the lumps and bumps which you are seeing may appear to be innocuous or may be missed if you have straight away crossed the barrier of cornea and started examining your cataract alone but but once you have this kind of a surface one your eye well power calculation will not be perfect and hence the results will also not be perfect and not only that this kind of an ebmd can also later on keep on presenting to you with recurrent erosions if you have not treated it properly these are the various conditions of the iris and the lens so if you see it's a post traumatic cataract on the extreme left a lenticular coloboma with a mature cataract pseudo exfoliatory material which is present on the pupillary border and on the lens various types of lens subluxations and an anterior dislocation of the lens which has completely collapsed the ac depth so the chamber is not at all available for you for any kind of intervention a mature cataract with iridocytes as you can see on the leftmost image the pigmentation that you see in the central image is the krukenberg spindle which is can be in a patient who is having pigmentary glaucoma there are uh, transpupillary illumination defects and iris uh, atrophy areas which you are seeing in the right image in the lower image again there are areas of iris atrophy which could be indicative of past history of angle closure glaucoma you can see here posterior synechia in the middle image and seclusio pupillae here wherein the pupil is not at all dilating so in all such cases you need to plan your surgical uh, devices or the additional interventions that you need to do the things you need to explain to your patient and during the surgery what all extra steps you need to take in order to make sure that this cataract surgery goes well so in pupil you need to rule out any meiosis or posterior synechia check for the reaction any pseudo exfoliatory material when you comes to finally comes to the cataract you have to grade and type the cataract rule out any uh, posterior polar kind of a cataract and also look for the 
zodular apparatus by asking the patient to move his or her eye. So this is the NOCS3 classification, which you're very well aware about. It studies for the nucleus, the opalescence, and the color, which is coming in the nucleus. For the cortical, the grading is C1 to 5. And posterior subcapsular cataracts are also graded from 1 to 3. So uh, this is the guidance or uh, the guideline which we use routinely in our clinics. And it helps us in determining which patient needs an, uh, an early intervention and which patient can keep on being observed. And it has been reported that PSC, of course, a posterior subcapsular cataract, of course, causes most clear, followed by cortical cataract and the nucleus chaotic cataract. So all these conditions like glaucoma, uveitis, high myopia, any history of retinal surgery or ocular trauma, a pseudo exfoliation, very importantly, history of refractive surgery or that of contact lens wear, all of these should be thoroughly examined before you proceed further for your surgical intervention. Do not forget the importance of doing a thorough retinal examination, fundus examination to rule out any developmental abnormalities, any degenerative conditions, anything which is happening in retina or on the optic nerve, any pallor, any glaucomatous cupping, diabetic retinopathy, age-related degenerations. And if you are not able to see the retina at all, do not forget that you do have access to an ultrasonography or a B scan, where at least an approximate idea of the health overall health of the retina can be taken and pathologies like a vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment or optic nerve abnormalities can be ruled out. Coming to the ocular measurements, you will be doing these topics in uh, great details in times to come. However, here we will be touching only the superficial parts of it. So most important thing in a patient of cataract surgery is first and foremost a biometry. What is the lens power that you will implant in this particular patient? So biometry requires keratometry. That is the measurement of the anterior surface of the cornea, the central 2 to 3 millimeter the two, uh, and axial length of the eye. Other examinations which become important in today's state and uh, ensure that the patient is on the right path are specular microscopy, ocular coherence tomography, and additional measures like pentacam or a corneal topography in certain difficult scenarios or cases. Also not to forget a B scan which will come handy if there is no availability or no uh, clarity in the media for you to take an examination of the retina. So preoperative measurements as we said in bio biometry, the most important components are axial length and a central corneal curvature or a keratometry. The axial length can be measured with a Zysal Master or a Lensstar LS900. These are non-contact devices that use the principle of partial coherence interferometry to determine axial length. And at the same time, they are able to give us a measurement of the corneal topography because they have a built-in keratometer and also give us a depth of the anterior chamber. They are quick and easy to use, give very precise measurements. And at the same time, they avoid the risk of any corneal compressions and hence the change in the readings or the uh, uh, in, uh, exact measurement of the lens that should be implanted. We can also do an ultrasound A scan, which can be used for all types of cataract, but it is more user dependent for accuracy. Immersion techniques as compared to a contact ultrasound A scan technique gives more accurate results. The keratometry can be also measured by manual or automated methods. However, try and take that you are at least doing an average of three readings and recording it with the proper axis. So this is biometry as you see on the left is the immersion scan. And on the right, you see the measurements as have been taken by the IOL master. So you will be able to get the kind of target refraction that you're setting, various formulas which are available to you, various types of lenses which you want to put in a single sheet. Uh, when we do a biometry, remember that 92% of the cases, the axial lens will fall within the range of 21 to 25.5 millimeters. 99% of the K readings will be in the range of 40 adapters to 48 adapters. Measure measurements are supposed to be repeated if the axial length is less than 21.2 millimeter, 
or 26 point more than 26.6 millimeter mean corneal power is less than 41 diopter or more than 47 diopter if the difference in axial length between the fellow eyes is more than 0.7 millimeter or if the difference in mean corneal power is more than 0.9 diopters coming to specular microscopy specular microscopy gives us an idea of the health of the endothelium you are well aware that endothelium is the structure which is responsible for maintaining the transparency of the cornea so we study the cell density which is number of endothelial cells per millimeter square coefficient of variation which is what is the variation in the cell size hexagonality or how many cells are exactly hexagonal in shape also the central corneal thickness when we are doing a specular microscopy if so as you see here in early and in advanced Fuchs dystrophy, there are large booty and the number of endothelial cells also tend to decrease. So it is said that if the number of endothelial cell density goes less than 1000 per millimeter square, or if the pachymetry measurements are becoming more than 640 microns, the patient has very, very high risk of corneal decompensation following the cataract surgery. There are recent technologies like backscatter also available, but to, I mean the most popular method even today at most centers is the specular microscopy. Paranta, can we continue? Yes, doctor, please continue. Yeah, okay. So uh, coming to uh, further calculations, so we already said important is biometry, specular microscopy. Till a few years back, there used to be a question mark as to whether we should do a macular OCT in all cases. A macular OCT or an optical coherence tomography of the macula is a non-contact, non-invasive, micron resolution, cross-sectional study of the retina, which is giving us images as good as the rest, retinal histology, right? Just that of the optical properties. But now it has said that between 10 to 17 percent of the cataract patients can have macular findings which may be easily missed on a clinical examination and in the 21st century when you have all the technology available you must not be making such kind of mistakes in your patients where you miss findings and later on the patient tends to suffer also to note epiretinal membrane is the most commonly misdiagnosis very commonly seen however, very easily missed. So as you see here in these images, this is a case where epiretinal membrane is there. You may miss it on a clinical finding, but not on an OCT scan. Various OCT scans like the left one showing you a full thickness macular hole, an idiopathic juxtafoveal telangiectasia in the left eye. If you come to the lower image, both eyes are having foveal schizes. You will easily miss this when you're seeing the retina only clinically. However, the OCT scan will warn you and your patient on possibility of a suboptimal visual recovery. Also to see uh, images, as you can see, there is a vitromacular traction on the right side. In the left image, you see there is a subretinal fluid, which is there. In the lower image, there is an adult vitelli form disease. And in the lower right image, you see there is a gross foveal thinning. These things cannot be easily deciphered on clinical examination alone. Hence, I would not say that ocular coherence tomography is now not an investigation that you can leave aside and not do in your patients. So if you see here, once again, there's a clinical example which is given. Because of the posterior subcapsular cataract, there is a lot of haze which is there in the right eye. So you are not able to find out what is the clinical picture. However, if you've done a high resolution OCT in this eye, you will find that there is a pre-existent cystoid macular edema which is present. So you cannot have these cases be ruled out unless and until you've already done an OCT. Coming to special measurements like that of corneal topography, a corneal topography gives us a map of the corneal contour and it is very important, especially in cases of irregular astigmatism or keratoconus or a history of previous refractive surgery, especially when you are planning multifocal or premium IOLs or a toric IOL is being planned. So corneal topography, either by OPSCAN or uh, topographer or by the Scheinflug topography method is very useful in difficult scenarios. 
a study of the corneal pachymetry, as we said, is helpful in assessing indirectly the functions of the endothelium. So as we see in these special cases, measurement of angle kappa, which is available on pentacam, angle kappa being the measurement between the pupillary axis and the visual axis, normally the angle being approximately 5 degree. If the angle is too large, then and you have planned in this patient a multifocal lens, then the patient will keep on having debilitating post-operative symptoms of dysphotopsias, glare and halos, and will never ever be satisfied. So you need to find out whether your patient is the right kind of candidate for the right kind of lens that you are thinking for the patient. Here we see certain cases and scenarios where the cornea is having irregular astigmatism. So the upper image is that of Salzman nodular degeneration and the lower image is that of a corneal scar. Again, in this image, you see pterygium, which is uh, stretching onto the cornea and uh, causing irregular astigmatism on the cornea. In such cases, a good method is to first remove the pterygium. And after around six weeks, once the corneal curvature has come down to a normal level, then uh, repeat the eye well power and then only do a cataract surgery instead of running for the cataract surgery in the first go. Mind you, an implantation of a toric eye well, if you have not removed the pterygium, will also not be extremely successful in treating these kinds of astigmatisms because these are irregular astigmatisms. A case of keratoconus here or a case of uh, PMCD also needs to be found out by uh, Pentacam. And in such cases, if there is a cataract, you need to take more central measurements by pentacam instead of using the normal keratometry values because an eye well master or your routinely available manual keratometers or automated keratometers will not be able to give you perfect values for the central corneal part that the patient is going to use for the rest of his life. So measurements with sophisticated Scheinflug technology which is giving you true net corneal power or an EKR measurement is definitely better than going for routine methods. So you see here there is a corneal scar again causing an irregular corneal astigma astigmatism along with the cataract. There are certain special tests uh, which are not very routinely used. However, for theoretically theory purposes, you must be knowing them, especially for cases where the cataract is very dense. So the purpose is like a potential acuity meter, which can help you in assessing the lens contribution to the visual loss. It is more predictive with moderate lens opacities. And it can give you an idea of what vision would be like if there were no opacities present. But to be very honest, I have not seen this instrument till date in my life. I don't know if uh, Dr. Pranita and Dr. Jyota have seen this. So we will be asking them once we finish this part. Uh, other special tests, especially of macular function, can be a medox rod, a simple test like a medox rod. Any large cotoma, it will, it will be represented as loss of red line of the medox glass as viewed by the patient. And that will raise the possibility of a significant macular disease. Another important test for macular function is the photostress recovery time. Normally, the photostress recovery time averages 27 seconds with a standard duration of 11 seconds. Then there is blue light entoptoscopy. Intense blue light background uh, under these conditions of white blood cells can be seen coasting through the peripheral capillaries producing shadow. Purkinia and toptic phenomena can be performed to see the shadow images of the retinal vasculature which we very commonly see in our own eyes as well. In special cases you can even keep go on to do an ERG or a VER that is a visually evoked response. Once you have done a thorough clinical examination, all the calculations, and before you send the patient home, you need to write certain suitable laboratory investigations. Worldwide, there are lots and lots of controversies as to what investigations are pertinent for a, cat of cat for a case of cataract surgery. They, uh, uh, people even say the importance of blood sugar or what is the kind of blood sugar levels that are 
uh, defined for a cataract surgery there is no a uh, defined version of these levels however routinely we need to know what is the blood pressure measurement we should do a blood sugar estimation if the patient is diabetic it's always better to to do a fasting pp and more importantly an hba1c examination which will give you an overall idea of what is the level of control that the patient is having on the sugar and a routine urine routine and microscopy is also performed the purpose is to rule out any source of infection which is present in the body and ecg is also ordered in most cases if you need to give a peribulbar block to the patient it tends to give rise to bradycardia so an ecg at hand becomes a very important tool also the kind of age group that you are dealing with is geriatric population which can tend to have multiple systemic disorders and need to be optimized prior to surgery which is a very stressful situation for them many of them may not have even seen the corridors of an uh, operating room so being kind to them and finding out what all can go wrong is very important without scaring them in patients who have had a history of blood transfusion it's important to do the triple markers if general anesthesia has been contemplated then your anesthesia colleague may order certain more investigations in your patient now i'll discuss in uh, very very quickly certain special circumstances and what are the preparations which you should have so this is uh, important because if you have examined your patient well if you have found out or you know studied your patient well right from the moment he or she walked into your chamber till the time you are ready to take the patient into the or your mind should have started preparing what will i do if this happens So, if the patient has a difficult access, a deep set eye, big eyebrow, aim for a temporal incision or a head tilt. If the cataract is too hard, make sure you have ordered a visco protection technique. So, you have ordered a Helon GV or a high viscosity uh, visco protected agent. You can also uh, you don't be afraid of giving or don't be shy at a later stage when you will start doing topical phaco emulsification. you will start feeling that let me do it in every case but don't let your ego come in between and think of the safety of the patient as the prime most goal don't be shy in giving a peribulbar block in hard cataracts a technology such as a femto cataract comes in handy because it softens the cataract before you have entered the eye a patient with diabetes can is at very high risk of worsening of retinopathy or developing a, a macular edema there is a high risk of pco and diabetic eye diseases can also tend to worsen so make sure you have in such cases taken a thorough consult with your retina colleague or you have yourself examined the retina properly if there is any uh, pre existent severe npdr or a pdr or a macular edema try to treat that first if the visibility permits if it does not keep the patient on close post op observation make sure you are giving good amount of post op nsh and uh, adjust the regimen of the topical steroids if a patient already have fuchs corneal endothelial dystrophy very important to warn the patient that there can be a prolonged post operative edema and also they, even if the surgery goes very well everything goes fine you don't know when the patient's cornea can decompensate and even many years later if the decompensation occurs patient may need a corneal graft during the surgery you can take extreme uh, precaution in the form of using good visco protection agents you will be studying about the machines later a good phaco machine uh, you know uh, based on say maybe venturis or uh, which have a very uh, stable chamber are extremely good in cases where you are having corneal endothelial dystrophy is a femto cataract again here becomes a better case uh, uh, surgical scenario because the cataract has been softened and you will be spending less energy and less time within the eye if the patient is having angle closure glaucoma or an open angle glaucoma you have to know that the patient will be having shallow anterior chamber so you have to have pre op mantol a possibility of an endocapsular tension rings visco protection ocular hypotensive agent pre and post op are very very important if the patient is high hyperopic a patient who comes to you with a plus 7 with a 30 aval power will definitely have a very shallow anterior chamber make sure you have enough visco protection you may need to do a limited vitrectomy initially itself and use the appropriate biometric formula while you are preparing the patient 
If the patient has high myopia, intraoperatively, there is a possibility of zonular laxity and a lot of fluctuation in the anterior chamber depth can occur. So you have to make sure that you decrease the bottle heights when you are operating such patients or use low perfusion uh, in such cases and uh, use the appropriate biometry formulas when you are preparing such patients. A small pupil or a meiotic pupil or a posterior sinecki pupil will need pupil stretching uh, devices. So while you are advising a surgery to this patient, you have to write uh, iris hooks or sphincterotomy or pupil expanders and patient has to be explained that the recovery will not be as quick as the patient tends to anticipate. There will be more inflammation expected as compared to a normal routine cataract. If the patient has a posterior polar cataract, you have to make sure that you have already made a mental note. You have already explained to the patient that at any point of surgery, the defective posterior capsule can rupture and the patient has more chances of complications as compared to a normal patient. If the cataract is very mature, you have to, of course, do a B scan, explain to the patient that you don't know about the macular health and only the amount of vision which has decreased because of the cataract is what the patient is going to recover post-cataract surgery and we don't have an idea of that. Patient may need a visco tamponade. Make sure you stain the capsule well. Once again, here a femto cataract, which is able to make a good opening on the mature lens, which has the possibility of a rupture, also known as Argentinian flag sign. A femto cataract will tend to prevent that. If the patient has zonal laxity, which you have seen in the form of phacodonesis, that is when the patient is moving the eye, you see the lenses also shaking or a lot of iridodonesis is there. You be prepared and write in your paper that the patient will require a peribulbar block, the patient will require a capsular tension ring, a vitroretinal backup, a possibility that the we may not be able to place the eye well inside the bag and hence need for a glued intraocular lens. All these things should be preoperatively itself explained to the patient. It not only decreases your heart rate when the complication occurs, it also helps the patient to feel safe and comfortable in your hands. If a patient has pseudo exfoliation syndrome, you again need iris hooks, pupillary expanders, endocapsular tension rings. So all these special circumstances will only be able to, you will be able to decipher if you are already looking for them. So the mind eyes only see what the mind already knows. So the purpose of this whole presentation is to open up your eyes for those different case scenarios which may not come in very easy when you're going for that next cataract case. So before I end my presentation, never forget this table, why not 2020? Why my patient is not 2020? Any patient who walks into your chamber, whether has a cataract, does not have a cataract, this was my professor's favorite saying, unless and until you've obtained the answer to the question, why my patient is not six, is, Six, six. Your uh, your examination is not complete. So rule out any pre-existent retinal causes of why not 2020. Rule out any pre-existent non-retinal causes like amblyopia, keratoconus, and incorrect eye power that is post-op. But any traumatic optic optic neuropathy or drug-induced optic neuropathy, and possibility of any pre-existent glaucoma which has not yet been diagnosed. So with this, I end my presentation. Thank you very much for a kind hearing and thank you for your patience. I think we are now open for discussion. Highly grateful for to Jaita ma'am and uh, Pranita and uh, Sunilji for helping me out with this presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kiran. That was like a really wonderful presentation. It covered all aspects. And I think it was especially useful to our uh, DNBs and PGs students because it gave a very comprehensive understanding of the various things we should look for when we are uh, preparing a patient for cataract surgery yes i think that, that was dr pranita would you like to add something to it jaita ma'am would you like to such add a, such a comprehensive talk that you have given ma'am i don't think we have left with anything uh, to add on and i think uh, mm -hmm. we have three students here also who are present with us uh, dr tulika Srivastav, she is a uh, DNB uh, fellow at uh, Center for Sight and uh, Dr. Kamini. Uh, she is a postgraduate, second year postgraduate at uh, Malanazad Medical College. 
and uh, Dr. Aditya he is a senior resident at uh, Lady Harding Medical College, and Dr. Ishita uh, she is a uh, DNB student at Centre for Sight again. So, ma'am, I think uh, you've given a wonderful talk, and this must have been eye openers for all the students who have been uh, attending this class. And the last thing that you said, I think I agree with you completely. Till the time you're not satisfied that you have found a cause why your patient is not 2020, you should not be satisfied with your workup. So that's, I think that's Absolutely. the most important thing uh, that you highlighted. And uh, so let's open up to questions first, and then we can add on uh, thing is left. So uh, yeah. let's start with uh, Dr. Tulika. Uh, can the uh, can the students please unmute and uh, switch on your cameras? Good evening, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful presentation. Ma'am, I wanted to ask you since uh, nowadays the refractive surgeries are so common, uh, in future the cataract surgeries in refractive patients is going to increase. So, what are the specific things that we should uh, be aware of? during pre-operative workup as well as post-op if they may have uh, some residual number or something, like how do we counsel them regarding them and what are the precautions we can take? Uh, yeah. so that That's a very good question. Uh, see, it's been 40 years that refractive surgery has been performed. The first PRK was performed 40 years ago. And now you are having all those patients who were getting their refractive surgery done many years ago coming up with cataracts. First and foremost thing in such cases, what I've realized now is to be upfront and asking. So many times if you're seeing a patient who had got a blade LASIK done many years ago and you're doing a normal checkup, you may land up missing the margins of or the border of the scar which is present post LASIK. In certain cases, it can happen. So it is very important to be upfront and asking the patient history of any refractive surgery or any kind of surgery done in past. There was another type of surgery which was performed earlier that is known as RK or refractive keratotopy. That uh, surgery has the particular uh, uh, you know, uh, course of action in future wherein the cornea tends to become flatter and flatter in the center with time. And also the cuts which have been made of the made on the cornea tend to weaken the cornea in those particular areas. Also, in cases uh, where you have got an RK done, it is very, very difficult to be highly predictive of the intraocular lens that you're going to in, uh, implant in such patients. So patient has to be warned about few things. Number one, the patient has got a history of RK. If the patient has a history of RK, you need to tell the patient that the cornea is irregularly irregular. So whatever lens power we are calculating is the closest approximation that we can come to, not exactitude as is being expected. Patient may, may need to definitely wear glasses for distance and reading both. If the central visual axis is not you know, is getting affected, I would really recommend not at all to think of any kind of multifocal or trifocal lenses in such cases. It should not be, it should be avoided in such cases. Also, the patient should be warned that during the surgery, any of the weak areas where the cuts have been put may just open up or pop out. And we may need to put sutures to close these areas. So patient should not have this reservation that suture needs to be put on my eye. When it comes to a refractive case or a post LASIK case, the surgical process per se is simpler. However, uh, most of these cases could have been high myopes, so uh, for, which is why a LASIK surgery was performed on them at the first place. So you must rule out any possibility of any weak areas in the retina prior to the surgery. If there are weak areas, if there are lattices or holes, they should be catered to prior to surgery. There are special formulas available, especially Barrett Sweet and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hege cell formulas, which are available on your IL Masters. If you do not have access to IL Masters, there are very good websites available like Dr. Hill, where you can put the finding which you're getting on your normal instruments and find out what is the closest IOL power which can come in this particular patient and still warn the patient. Though post LASIK patients are getting extremely good results, what with the newer uh, formulas which are available on the IRL masters. 
However, it is important to warn the patient about the possibility of need of spectacles. Post surgery, despite choosing any specific. Oh, Dr. Jaita, ma'am, you would like to add something to it? Jaita, ma'am, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think you have covered this uh, quite uh, well, Dr. Kiran. And I think we'll have a special class on this also about yeah. uh, the biometry in special situations. And that will, and what I would think is that maybe you'll need to calculate. Uh, the, you know the I will power by two three different methods. Then it is, uh, and then you kind of uh, reach a consensus. So it is better to, and also your K readings you should have from a couple of different sources. Like you should take your, uh, you know, pentacam Ks, and then you take your I will master Ks. Uh, so like that, you, you can have a kind of a consensus because also it would help if you have some previous records. In some cases, patients may carry their preoperative pentacams, so that might also help. Yeah, in the pentacam, even uh, we can uh, have a look yeah. at the KR value. So it is again in the same vein. Sorry. Yeah, even in the pentacam, we can have a look at the EKR values. That is the equivalent K readings in the central uh, 2.5, 3 millimeter, 3.5 millimeter zones, which will give you a more accurate idea of your keratometry. Since we, as ma'am already discussed, that the the central cornea uh, tends to flatten way more than uh, what are the changes in the peripheral cornea. So while your IL master and lens star is measuring the curvature in the three to four millimeter zone, the central two, three millimeter zone may be way further more flatter compared to your mid peripheral cornea. So if you have an access to a topography, which can give you the central two, three millimeter zone or the EKR values, then you can be even more close to your, uh, to an accurate IL power in these patients. But yes, if that's not available, the online calculators that ma'am said that gives you an option that you can use any of the available equipments giving you the keratometry to calculate the alphas. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. I would also like to add here about the EKR. Uh, there is also another thing called true net power, which you will be gradually reading as you go through your pentacams. So true net power calculates the uh, central power of around 2.3 mm to 3 millimeter of cornea and it approximates the power that is the ratio of the anterior and posterior corneal power both not anterior corneal alone in LASIK specifically the gull strand ratio has now changed so it is not the same eye as it was the uh, previous size so a true net power is considered to be a better approximation but yes the newer methods and the newer formulas even with the anterior topography or the anterior keratometry alone are able to give us good results. Thank you, ma'am. So we can you. move on to the next uh, student, uh, Dr. Kamani. Do you have any questions to ask? Uh, in the meantime, we can move to Dr. Aditya. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, Dr. Aditya good is evening, at Lady Harding Medical College. Uh, yes, Dr. Aditya, please. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to know that if there are any preoperative findings where we should avoid putting a multifocal uh, IOL. Yeah, so there are lots and lots of preoperating findings, uh, starting from the moment the patient comes to your chamber. First and foremost is behavioral. Uh, uh, and his uh, expectations of the surgery. It is very important to titrate the patient's expectation out of a multifocal eye well because even if your patient is a perfect candidate for a multifocal surgery eye-wise, the patient may come out to be the most dissatisfied patient because his expectations were not titrated to the tech. So first and foremost is understanding the patient's personality and his psyche and his expectations. That's number one. Number two, when it comes to the eye, there are a lot of case scenarios which are where I would rather say avoid a multifocal eye well. Uh, here, starting bang from the cornea, if there is any scar on the cornea, a case where there is a pterygium and it is stretching on the cornea causing irregular astigmatism of any sort, a keratoconus, an ectasia, a PMCD, or even a case of EBMD, an epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, anywhere that the cornea is not perfect, Please avoid multifocal eye wells. 
as you enter inside, even a patient of Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, it is rather better to give the patient good vision for distance and let the patient be on spectacles. That is my uh, request. Early morning, many a times these patients are already into already decompensation stage. So morning vision drop becomes very debilitating for them. When we enter inside the eye, if the pupil is uh, not dilating well for you to examine the patient thoroughly, Again, avoid any kind of multifocal eye. This is my recommendation. If the patient has a history of glaucoma and you see an advanced kind of uh, glaucomatous optic atrophy or uh, glaucomatous optic nerve changes, avoid uh, multifocal eye wells. Also to be avoided in cases where there is any diabetic retinopathy or age-related macular degeneration, which is already present in the patient's eye. Another place where it is said that the patient will be highly dissatisfied is when the angle kappa is very large. So as we mentioned on the pentacam, you can measure an angle kappa. So if it is more than 5 degree, it's way beyond 5 degree. It's rather better that you don't put a multifocal eye well because a decentered multifocal eye well will produce more dysphotopsias for the patient to be, you know, troubled post your perfect surgery. Um, Ma'am, would you like to add something to it? Yeah, I think also patients who have undergone previous refractive surgeries should be careful. Like they may be quite dissatisfied post RK, post LASIK patients. Sometimes they may have some residual errors. So these patients may not be very satisfied. Patients who are, uh, you know, uh, depending on the occupation, like if a patient uh, needs to drive at night or use, uh, you know, he has to work yes. under low light conditions, those patients uh, may also not be satisfied. Myopes are generally not, not that, not a very great, who have who been used to a very good quality of vision for both distance and near. So the, uh, the uh, occupation of the patient, the previous refractive error and the personality, you know, a patient who's never worn glasses before and uh, is doesn't have very visually demanding work, uh, you know, may be a good candidate, but of course you should spend some time in counseling the patient and always is, you know, you must mention that patient may still have a residual refractive error and uh, may need, uh, you know, classes even after uh, putting a multifocal or a trifocal lens. Always remember in practice, whether it is cataract surgery, whether it is refractive surgery, it is very important to emphasize that the purpose of any keratorefractive or in fact cataract refractive surgery is not to make the patient's spectacle number zero or to definitely give the patient a spectacle free six by six. The purpose is to make sure that functionally patient does not require glasses for most activities of daily living. There is a lot of difference between the two. So we do not need six by six for all of our activities in our day to day life. That needs to be emphasized onto the patient before you proceed for any kind of surgical procedure, which uh, is involving especially any uh, premium eye well. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Most welcome. Thank you, Dr. So, uh, Dr. Ishita, do you have any more questions? Dr. Ishita, Dr. Kamani? I think uh, they are uh, currently not able to communicate. So, ma'am, uh, I think we have had a wonderful session. Just one thing that I would like to add. As we, you were discussing about the potential equity meter, I guess. So, yeah. um, yes, obviously, we know it's not something which is routinely or commonly used in practice, in clinical practice. It is not available, but yes, in institutions for a research purpose, it is, I have seen it, it was available at RP Center Ames. But nothing that I have seen it in common practice anywhere else. It does help in uh, estimation of the visual equity in patients where the media is hazy and you're not able to uh, truly estimate the vision. But it's not 100% foolproof or 100% accurate. So it, you cannot completely rely upon these equipments to you know prognosticate your patient. These are not very reliable instruments for prognostication of the patients. So thank you, Dr. Panita. I think that was like a really good discussion we had. And uh, thank you for sharing all your points. And a big thank you to Dr. Kiran and to all thank our you, students who've joined. Thank you very much for your active participation and for all the questions you've asked. So 
I think we can end the session for today. Yes. yes Thank you, Tim, ma'am. That was an exhaustive talk, and you covered it so really well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, and have a good time, all of you, and all the best for to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.